Right, Neil Price would like staking. He'd like to know some actual figures. So say from a thousand pound betting bank, what would your maximum bet be? How do you decide what your stake's going to be? He'd like to know the actual mechanics you use to arrive at your desired stake for each individual bet, please. Okay, so for a, a bank of that size, it'd be very different to how I'd have to approach it. Um, it's all about um, you know, being careful with your bank and that sort of thing. There's, there's stuff you can read up if you look at the Kelly criterion, uh, that covers it. But I can give you a bit of help with that because that talks about how you pick a stake based on your bank, based on the odds of the horse and based on the actual odds of the horse. Now, the trouble is, if you approach that, um, as some people would read that, there's a danger you'll be too bold because you'll say this horse is four to one and I think the true odds is two to one. But you'd only treat it as that if your profit margin is genuine, generally that high. If you were, if, if when you thought a horse was two to one, it did actually win 33% of the time. Now for nobody ever, I've ever met, will that be true? So what you actually have to have a handle on, either as an estimate or by analyzing your results, is that when you do think a horse to your perspective is two to one, and it's available at four to one, how often does it win? Or what percentage profit do you make in that situation? So if, for example, you believe that you're, that there's a margin of 10% when you take that price, or it might be that you're taking a price very early because you're able to get on at five, you might believe there's a 20% profit margin. But you've got to base your profit margin not on your perception of how, you, some, how you've assessed the price, but instead on what is a realistic estimate of what the price is based on what you think. And that, that will mean that, that your estimate of the true odds will be closer to the actual odds uh, than, just, than just your own opinion. But if you put that thought into it, have a look at the Kelly Criterion. For me, it's a different challenge because as time's gone on, the bookmakers have got wary of, of bigger bets. Uh, and obviously, I've, you know, I, 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 my betting bank, if you like, has, has increased. Um, so I'm not in, my, my bets are restricted pretty much by what I can get on rather than any need to, um, uh, to, to preserve the bank. And so Kelly doesn't apply to me. But this, the challenge for me is uh, more about at what point are you taking a price that is a price that you've created by your own activity. Um, so the danger is if, if you're backing a horse at a certain price and then it's shortened up by uh, you know, a certain percentage, how much that might have been what, what I've done. And there's a danger you're then taking your own price. Um, so those sorts of considerations. And the other consideration at, at, at the higher staking level is you don't always want to, to necessarily maximize your profit in that race. It may well be that a more subtle approach might make it easier to get your bets on the next day, the next month or whatever. So um, yeah, th those sort of nuanced considerations come in but, you know, at the higher staking level. And I've just got a chip in here from a personal interest. Would you not factor in your worst losing run and take that into account when you're picking your stakes? Yeah, well, the Kelly thing will give you a thing, but your actual worst losing run will be uh, yeah, affected by random factors. So the, the, the Kelly is more of a calculation based on average expectations. Um, but yeah, if, if, if that's, for some that might be too technical, but you're having a reasonable expectation of how things have gone in the past, that's not a bad rule of thumb, yeah. Okay, right, Brazza72, it says, Patrick's won a lot of money gambling, but does he think possibly his insistence on making decisions alone has held back his profit and loss compared to punters like Alan Woods, Bill Brenter and Joe Co, who built huge team syndicates to split the work and assess many different variables? <laughs> yeah, so perhaps don't keep reminding me of that. <laughs> um, not least because obviously those, those, those markets are operating differently uh, elsewhere where there were great big tote pools and no bookmakers. But... Although that's possibly true, you know, were that to have worked for me, um, I've had a very free life to be able to organise my time as I wanted. And, you know, I've had two very big setbacks in my life that took a while to, to refine my balance and possibly the fact that I had a very free existence where I could just stop um, put me in a better position to, uh, to, to refine that balance. Okay, Ben Ashmal would like to know, outside the fixture list, is there any other advice you'd give to the various bodies in racing? <laughs> well, people like the fact that I had a list before, so, so I have another list. <laughs> but we'll just briefly go back to fixtures. Sorry about this. Um, we have heard back from the, from the bookmaking industry, and there has been some talk on this subject. And a comment from the bookmaking industry included that, um, that they weren't actually seeking more racing anymore. Okay, well, finally, we might have reached that point, but um, that's like saying that, um, you know, amongst drinkers, you've, you've got drinkers to, to, to increase from three bottles of wine a week to 10 bottles of wine a week, and you're not now seeking 12. It's quite a good analogy, actually, because 10 bottles of wine a week, you can survive for quite a long time, but you are probably doomed in the end. 
Um, so there's a comparison there. Um, yeah, uh, it's still way too many bottles of wine. And um, particularly fitting at the moment, I thought last week, Simon, that there were 31 flat meetings. It was a week with no jump racing, you know, I'm a bit of a fan of that, um, the, the concept of a break. Um, but yeah, they didn't need to fill in with not only all the jumps fixtures that you would have expected, but extra flat ones as well. Um, and so early in the season, you're basically passing a message to the punters there of be under no illusion. You have no hope of keeping up with all this. Um, there's been talk in the last day or two of field sizes, but to some extent field sizes is shutting the, the stable door off its bolted because the lower field sizes stems from, amongst other things, reducing the popularity of the support by it being unfathomably large in terms of fixtures. Um, the other thing about field sizes is that, okay, we're reacting to that now, but I'm not claiming credit because there were many people saying it, many people saying 18 months ago that this was sure to happen, greatly reduced field sizes. And now we're sort of saying, well, now it's happened as, frankly, we knew it was going to. I mean, I was quoted as saying that very much smaller horse population was a certainty. That's what I said 18 months ago. And now we're talking about, as I say, reacting just to field sizes is too late in itself. Um, so, um, yeah, but at least there are some positive signs. Um, you know, there, there are, are some positive signs. I have had a little bit of contact with the BHA and, and obviously there's, there's engagement with other people and that sort of thing. Um, and I have said I'm willing to meet and, and talk them through. One thing I need to stress here, this is not me saying I can prove this with maths. I'm saying that other people have uh, believe that they've proved their case with maths and that the maths is just wrong. This is not something that can be solved with maths. The evidence from example, for example, of, of, of the loss of market share, the evidence from the customers who are shrieking from the rooftops that they don't want this. And it's non-mathematical people coming and using what is frankly a mathematical argument that is just plain wrong. Um, but if a meet, if people do want a meeting, I'll always try to help with that if they want to, to hear that. And um, let's say if, um, if they wanted to hear the opposing view, then they should feel free to invite Martin Credis of Arc. And, um, and he could rigorously examine my points and I would look forward to rigorously examining his. Um, he said, I think in the paper today, there was no real case for the reduction in fixtures list, but that's a little rich in that there was no case for the increase in the first place. It was based on utterly flawed data analysis. It might have been a case for ARC, because ARC were the biggest beneficiary, I believe, in the, in the I might not, that's, that's the best I'm aware, but uh, in the increase in fixtures, as I say, that I don't have exact numbers on that, um, but they certainly benefited from that. But in terms of the racing industry, and if you look at the long-term outlook, five, 10 years from when this started or from now, excess fixtures is a loser. Um, so yeah, let's hope further's done on that. Um, three other little things outside of fixtures. I'll finally stop talking about that. Um, first, the owners. If you're picking a trainer, and one of the factors you use is, does that trainer have a lot of winners? Um, then it should be not the number of winners, but the number of winners divided by the number of horses. I mean, maybe not as simple as that, but broadly speaking, be more interested in, is the trainer having winners per horse than just winners? It, it's clear that a lot of people making their decisions do not build that in. Um, handicappers. Handicappers, I think you should spend less time engaging with trainers. I've met some marvellous trainers who have taught me so much and m m interesting things to say outside of racing. But um, when they talk about the handicapping of their horses, this is something to avoid. I would also advise owners, punters, whatever, if you do talk to trainers, try to steer away from, away from them talking about the handicapping of their horses. After five minutes, sometimes you feel your head's going to explode. <clears throat> After 10 minutes, you're worried that it's not going to explode. You just want it to be over quickly. Um, Essentially, handicapping a race is, is like um, you, you, know, you draw a regression line. And for people who are not familiar with that term, you're just drawing, a, roughly speaking, a line from the highest rated horse in the race to the lower rated horse in a way that fits in with the data points, the previous ratings of those horses. Well, when trainers talk about the handicapping of their horses, they always see the points below the regression line. That's the only points they can see. But when they're complaining that other people's horses are well handicapped, they only see the points above the regression line. And uh, yeah, generally speaking, the handicapping of horses would be better if there was just a formal appeal system, not a situation where trainers blag the handicappers and generally push them into methods that are less good than if they weren't involved. And the final one, bookmakers. I'm not convinced that this business of constantly playing with the place terms is as good as you think it is. Um, it's important in golf because it's very, very hard to back the winner in golf. And also in golf, the place terms are static. You're not constantly changing the number of places. But this business, if it starts out, you're expecting a quarter, first three, then you're getting a boost to a fifth, first four, and then there's a non-runner, so you're back worse than you started. 
and combined with a situation of, I'm not sure this is being thought through, that sort of some of the customers are going to be really irritated when you say those terms aren't available for them, or you don't want to lay in each way, but not just to the pros or the Sharpies. I'm just not sure this is as good as they think it is. It's making it overcomplicated. And the customers you really want are the ones that only really care about the price and don't even think about place fractions. It's not the same as golf where 10 places is really important. Punters are slightly in horse racing more focused on backing a winner. I think they're doing too much on that. Okay. Uh, now Shane has got the double up. He's got another question. Um, how would you go about growing a small bank into something semi-pro from scratch in the modern betting world? Similar to what I said before, uh, I would keep the, uh, you know, I, I would keep the expenses low. Um, I would, uh, you know, uh, have another income, and I would um, be looking more towards, uh, rather than you know having to spend a huge amount of time and expense, sort of grabbing prices and that sort of thing, finding sustainable edges that will last you in the future by by looking for areas where the market's wrong when it has finished moving. You know, towards the uh, towards the latter part of the day. Okay, um, Peter Robinson, where do you place the most emphasis on, or how do you rank the following in relation to a horse's chance? Trainer, jockey course, surface going, trip, handicap mark, information, price, perceived value, left hand, right hand, straight versus round course, all the above, are all the above assessed in the equation? In fact, how do you pick your winners? Ha. Um, well, that's as I sort of touched on the previous time. It's not an answer I can give because it's all about value. It's not about which is the most important factor. You can have one of those things, it might be the fourth most important, but if, it, but it, but if it's the one where you're finding value, um, even if it doesn't, you know, then, then that's more interesting. But the trouble is that if, rightly or wrongly, people have got some respect for my opinion, if I said, oh, my favorite thing is jockey, I think there's a real edge there, even if I didn't explain how I did it, by attracting more attention to that, that, that side of things, then obviously prices would go down. Prices would go down about those where there was a, a, you know, a, an underestimated factor. Um, so, so within days or weeks of me making that statement, the value would ebb away. And, and, and because in the modern world you have to have lots of edges to, to do sufficiently well, um, yeah, you're just in a situation where the value would erode. Um, I did comment on this slightly more back in the day when I wrote the book because I was commenting on things that had worked in the past. So I was able to talk quite a bit about draw biases because they were something that was easy to make money with, you know, sort of many years ago. And since then, the, you know, the BHA and the courses have done you know, sort of a much better job in le leveling those out. And the, and the clerks are much more aware. That's now a minefield. And, and so the reason I was able to talk about those winners and back based on the draw was because it wasn't a subject that was interesting to me anymore. It was really interesting then, but it became massively more difficult. But in terms of where you find your edges, Yes, I think the social media thing can be very useful for encouragement, for um, talking about the mental side, for general relaxation and chit chat about the sport you're interested in. But if you're going to make it in the long term, you need to find some edges that you don't give away. Um, and that uh, it, in the end, chatting about what's good or bad in detail, in detail methodology, favours the bookmakers because it makes them, as part of these discussions, better able to price up and it means that the people that come on to them at 5 p.m. with the early moves are going to be more informed as well. So, yeah, do, don't be frightened to be, you know, yes, ultimately, whether you're a good person is probably going to be governed by matters outside horse racing. Um, don't feel obliged to give up your edges in horse racing because it, it's a hard enough game. OK, now, Paul Fitzgerald says, from the traumatic events you've experienced and lived through, is there one lesson that stands out above all and um, that you take from it? Or alternatively, a core belief that you've always had that has been reinforced by what you've gone through and he wishes you continued success. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Um, I suppose when you go back to those sorts of events, um, the thing I've learned is you can come back. Um, that, but you have to be patient. And <clears throat> in those really tricky times, and people are going to have their own very tricky times, it's not just me, uh, and things might be completely outside racing, personal life, family, etc. Um, that sometimes you have to just hold it together and you have to be patient and, and just wait and go through a period of, yeah, just, just enough is hold, it's enough and hard enough to hold it together and then come back when you're ready.